Is Lars Ulrich of Metallica a useless drummer? No, he is definitely not. It's very easy to critique Lars. I've done it. Plenty of musicians that I personally know and respect have done it. But how many of these people will put their money where their mouth is? This is Nathan Sletner. He's my drummer for my band Crusade. He's insanely talented, and he's been vocal about his critiques of Lars's execution in the past. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm so nervous. What are your thoughts on Metallica and particularly the drum parts of Metallica? Uh, I, I kind of think when I think of Lars in general, I kind of think of him as an ideas guy. Uh, and ideas guys are not generally the best executors, but you you need ideas guys. I'm, I'm sitting here feeling really self-conscious with all this. <laughs> What I'm saying is when I when I think of him, I think like, oh, so, you know, with some exceptions, I can think of songs where I go, why in the hell did he do that? After the fact, like falling in love with it as a kid, and then growing up and being like, what the hell is this drum part? <laughs> right. I kind of think that it would be fairly simple for me to go through and play the parts themselves with a different feel. That's 100% certain. Oh, I, un undeniably, which, which is not what we're doing today. Right. I'm just kind of doing my thing. Today we're going to be looking at my friend's attempt to replace Lars and Metallica. This is a really fun experiment. First things first, I do want to give a thank you to SC Electronics for sending us some drum mics to use for this video. We're going to be talking about them quite a bit here. This project took us to Cloverland Sound in Nashville, Tennessee with engineers Trevor Hoffert and Chris Baldani. Chris and Trevor are both very accomplished engineers, both for tracking and mixing. They were assisting us with tracking drums that day, and thank goodness because it was much more complicated than we were expecting. <laughs> See, a lot of metallic songs, especially the older stuff, don't really fit neatly on a metronomic grid. That means the tempo floats, which can be really cool. It's really nice getting that natural push and pull of tempo for tension, but makes it very difficult to record along to. <laughs> so because of that, Nate was not able to utilize a click while recording these tracks. I was able to find some stems of these Metallica songs. We removed the drums. And surprisingly, when you're trying to record drums with headphones on and monitor the songs, it is very difficult to feel and hear the downbeat without it. A lot of this has to do with the saturation of the guitars, but I think this especially emphasizes the importance of the drums in that mix. So trying to keep Nate playing in time with the tracks was much more of a challenge than we anticipated. But thanks to these mics that SE Electronics sent me, the V-Kick, the V7, and the SE8, they removed a ton of headache that we could have had otherwise. Sounds a lot better than I expected already, like just by itself. That's a pretty full picture sound already. And that's just a kick in, right? That's just the kick in, yeah. And Trevor, do we? Did you change the way I placed that? I didn't even touch it. No, yeah, it's just funny thing straight in the I port. I yeah. just dropped it in the port. I didn't like necessarily like take any time to place that. So that's actually a little shocking. They're definitely like smooth overall. Like they're not nearly as harsh is like you kind of would expect. That feels like those are like kind of punching above their weight class. <laughs> for the record, even for very accomplished engineers, they normally have to do some small mic movements and adjustments, and these needed nothing. <laughs> it's like dead in. We kept the mix pretty natural to really highlight the tonality of these mics. Seriously, guys, for the price, these mics really pack a punch. And they're extremely roadworthy. That's what we're using them for. We use them for the road. You can get links to buy these mics in the description. But I digress. I gave Nate four clips from different Metallica songs with no drums on them and asked him to lay down his own parts. He does not know the songs intimately and he is not a thrash drummer. So it was very interesting to hear this fresh perspective on these legendary songs. Due to the tracking difficulties that I was talking about earlier, there are moments where the tempo floats a little bit, it's a little loose, and all we really did was run a few passes of each clip. Besides some minor time correction, these are the raw takes and performances. He did not put a ton of time into writing intricate parts for each of these. He just kind of went through each pass and kind of felt it and learned as he went. Now I know what I think of Nate's performances, but I wanna know what you guys think. Do me a favor, in the comments down below, I want you to rank each of Nate's performances and then tell me why you rank them that way 
and if you thought that any of them were better or worse than Lars's. All right, enough prep. This is the first clip we did. It was the intro of Fuel. This is one uncut take. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. <laughs> similar, but I think he spiced it up just a little bit. Just a, just a smidge of spice. Spicy lightning is how I describe Nate's drumming very regularly. <laughs> it feels unnatural just because we're so used to hearing Lars's drum writing there that I feel like it's very easy to say that doesn't sound right. But you are talking about literal decades of confirmation bias. That's pretty hard to undo. <laughs> I'm just asking for people to try and keep that in mind when you're evaluating these. It's very difficult. Okay, the next clip we gave him was the outro of No Leaf Clover, my favorite Metallica song. This one has the most comping. I stitched together a few different sections of three different takes that I think best represented Nate's ideas. And here we go. curious about what y'all think on that one. I have my own thoughts, but you won't know what those are until you comment down below. Next, we have a long clip from the outro of one, arguably the most legendary Metallica moment ever. Now remember, Nate is not a thrash drummer, and this is an exceedingly thrash part. So hearing his ideas contrasted against the ideas on the drums that we fell in love with to this song is really interesting. <laughs> I have a feeling I know how many people will react to this one. <laughs> this is two takes stitched together uncut. So basically the first minute is half of a take and then I cut in another minute of a different take, but each of those are solid uncut takes themselves. Here we go.
Again, due to confirmation bias, if it feels off to you in certain places, I'd encourage you to go back and listen a few more times. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying in order to evaluate it honestly, I think it deserves a few listens. That's all I'll say. In the last clip, I gave him the solo from Unforgiven. This is one uncut take. So now that you've heard all of these, how would you rank them? Which ones were the best? Which ones were the worst? Did he do better or worse than Lars? Let me know in the comments down below. I can tell you generally that I was intrigued by how Nate was able to recontextualize these riffs in a way that I would have never thought about them before, and it was kind of cool. Or there's even parts that are very similar, but he spiced up the intricacy in a more engaging way. But in other parts, it feels like it kind of loses some energy and doesn't fully encapsulate the absolute attitude of thrash. All in all, I loved doing this experiment, and everyone involved learned some pretty valuable stuff from it. I actually sat down with Nate afterwards, the Lars critic, and wanted to get his perspective on what he learned. But since SC Electronics sent me these mics, I also did want to sit down with Chris and Trevor about what they thought about these mics as professional engineers in Nashville. It's not just because they sent me the mics. I really want to impress upon newer engineers or musicians just how much value you get for what you buy with these mics. Here's what Chris and Trevor had to say after this session about what they thought about these microphones. The moment that I put the kick mic up, uh, before, I mean, I always try to EQ a little bit on the way in for me. Uh, I didn't have to. It sounded great right up front. And immediately it had the character I was looking for. You could very, very easily just with those two filters on there, get a sound as somebody who's less experienced. On, on the modern settings. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Of different settings too. I mean, like yeah. just being able to do all those things at once. There's so many kick mics out there in the market in that price range that are just as good. They don't have all the EQ features and the little stuff that kind of, for someone who's a beginner, so they're not gonna know where to cut, right? It's more versatile. I would say it's more versatile, yeah. Especially yeah. for someone who may not know. I mean, for us too, it's versatile, but especially if you're talking about someone who is getting into it and they don't yeah. know the specific frequencies to cut to make the mic well, sound right, well, they can just flip a switch and it already sounds great for someone that might not necessarily be running an interface where you can eq on the way in or if you don't have hardware like you know if that's, that's not that's me it's awesome to have something with that starting point yeah you know that solid of a starting point what i mostly appreciate about the microphones is that <laughs> they don't come standard with pictures of michael b jordan's face all over them <laughs> Which would be distracting. We need to appreciate I, this. I, I keep like tr trying not to look at. <laughs> love it. Yeah, he just keeps pointing a stick at us. I it's, keep it's like trying it. not to like look at it because it's like distracting. <laughs> like, 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 I'm just like, like on this camera screen, I'm like a first person shooter character. <laughs> Hell like yeah. in a really bad Harry Potter game. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. If you have a couple hundred bucks and you're thinking, I really want a set of overheads, or I want something for acoustic guitars, mm -hmm. or I want something for you know just any kind of stereo source and you're looking for a pair like that this feels like it would be worth to me like Th this price point is about 500 yeah. give or take mm -hmm. yeah so i mean like you know saving a couple hundred extra to go for this kind of thing that feels like there's like a lot of quality there that you're getting that I, I definitely um, recommend spraying for the extra. We've always shied away from pencils for a lot of different applications, even if they might be the, the quote unquote the right move. What I loved about these pencils is they have what pencils have, which is an extra focus in directionality and like symbol um, 
uh, picture, mm -hmm. but these also had so much good kit picture, and that's why yeah. we steer away from pencils a lot, is because shells don't come through as well on pencils sometimes, at least in our personal experience. And we like a lot of drum in our overheads because we rely on a lot of that picture. The yeah. SM81 is like one of my favorite pencils. Like those are amazing mics. They're great. You can't really buy a matched set of those. I love them for spots. They're great mics. What I want on a session for my main overheads, knowing they are going to be matched as close as they possibly can and that they're going to be consistently easy to use in my workflow. I haven't sprung for a pair of 81s yet. This I am more inclined to, and it's in a slightly price lower price range, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Especially with how much it does, and like it still has pads, it still has yeah. filters, yeah. like it, they, they're not, it doesn't feel like they're skimping on features. You know, I've been reaching for those in other studios for 10 plus years yeah. because I love them. Yeah, and the fact that I'm like, quickly willing to talk about these in the same conversation speaks to the quality of that. I feel every bit as comfortable with, with these. Hearing what they sound like on overheads, I'm immediately wondering what it would sound like on my Martin Marimbas. My bottom line, last sentence review of these mics. I'm going to ask you if we can borrow them sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Before I buy my own. That, that is huge. <laughs> to clarify, we're buying them as yes. well. Like, I just like, yes. I want to make that abundantly clear. Yeah. Like, my yeah. gear addicted ass is buying these very quickly. I actually feel proud that I get to put my name next to these products because I believe they are an affordable solution to my audience, the people that want to get help from me and help up their game. This is a great way of doing that on a budget. If you're looking for your first set of drum mics or even looking for an upgrade from a crappy cheaper set, definitely pick up these mics. We use them. My band uses these. Plus the pencil mic and the V7 have multiple different applications. And again, I'd be saying this even if they didn't send the mics to me. <laughs> again, links to those mics are in the description down below. So back to the star of the show, Nate. What did Nate learn from this Lars replacing experience? What surprised you about trying to play over top of Metallica tracks and take the place of Lars? It was, well, aside aside from figuring out where exactly the timing on things was because they're not playing to a metronome. That I would say is the most challenging part. It's, it's very nice and convenient to have a metronome to lock into, especially when the guitars are built the way that they're built on these tracks. Some of those spots, I had to listen really hard to to be lined up, and hopefully I hopefully I got them. God only knows how how that was recorded. Was that drums first? Did he just memorize the parts? Did he play? Did he play to a scratch track? If he just memorized all of those, then that's awesome. And just the sheer mass of changes in that is actually just just kind of ending. impressive. Yeah. Yeah, just the ending. How would you feel about Lars as a writer for drums in this new context? I actually like his ideas a lot more, having paid more attention to these. There's, I've noticed this in playing cover songs. I like, I used to hate STP, and then I learned STP songs, and I was like, holy shit, STP is amazing. It is pretty crazy when you start actually learning the stuff that you like you listen to it you're like oh that's easy and then you go and you dig into the musicality of it and you're like but it's fun yes i already told you earlier but i wouldn't really change a thing on like no leaf clover because i love that song when you said yeah we're doing a clip of that i'm like oh yeah i'm not i'm not gonna do anything to that i'm just <laughs> I, mean, I won't i'm not gonna learn it note for note i'm just gonna like do a couple of honest takes and just see what comes out but i love i love that i w wouldn't change it not for the world uh, same. Yeah, it's uh, that is actually my favorite Metallica song. Agreed. Do you have more respect for Lars Ulrich now than you did before? Yes, I do. I I wouldn't say I totally, you know, hated Lars. I kind of tried to preface that before we start started playing. It's not a hot take to for a drummer to be like, "Yeah, Lars Ulrich sucks at the drums." I'm like, cool. Do you have any opinions that you haven't gotten from the internet? <laughs> As a part writer and just just with the ability to memorize and then play those parts, however well they are executed, is is impressive and above average. Honestly, it, it's making me want to go through a bunch of those records now, which I can't say that 
anything previously has made me more. <laughs> that's totally but, fair. But now, now I'm there, so that's what it is. How, that's that's really cool. All right, word. Fucking hey, thanks, thanks, man. Yeah, you're welcome. I agree. It's easy to say that Lars is not the most technically consistent drummer, but he really does have a great drum writing perspective that obviously works. These songs wouldn't be legendary if it didn't. <laughs> he may not be the flashiest drummer out there, but he does have a ton of attitude and a great intuition. Part of the reason why I love the SM record so much is because he just kind of feels the moment and doesn't play exactly what you get on the record. So did we change your mind about Lars? Let me know in the comments down below, and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.